Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between humans and animals in one of the most beautiful places on Earth, Hawaii. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. We'll learn just what it takes to have a horse as a pet. Getting a horse is not like getting a dog or a cat. It's, it's a lot more like having a child. We'll discover a new sport called canine scent detection. They already know how to use their nose. We're just giving them a context and a parameters that's acceptable to us as people. We'll race to the finish line and find out what wieners are winners. And we'll learn all about the Toy Fox Terrier. Pets in Paradise TV starts now. Over the years, humans have been developing sports for their dogs. Competitions ranging from dock diving to sled racing, agility tests, surfing, hunting, and many more. But if your dog isn't an athletic jock, there's a new sport you may want to enroll him in. It's the most fun I've had with dogs in 25 years, so. <laughs> there's no pressure. Don't have to spend money on it. It's uh, easy to do. My dog enjoys to smell things out. Her nose is very strong, so we thought that this would be an activity that would be perfect for her. Introducing canine scent detection, also known as nose work, scent work, and search work. So you see what's happening with it is going under the vehicle a little bit. The little dogs have to work it out just tight. Good. It's a fairly new sport that focuses on your dog's nose abilities. The sense of smell in the dog is so powerful and it's con uh, connected to so many parts of the dog's brain, um, emotional areas of the brain, how the dog feels, that we see a lot of great and positive changes in many dogs by allowing them the opportunity to explore this part of who they are. Also helping in their search is a secret weapon that only animals have, the Vomero nasal organ, most commonly known as Jacobson's organ. It's located near the nasal cavity and gives the dog an additional receptor, almost like they're tasting the air. You can tell that a dog is using his Jacobson's organ when he holds his mouth in a semi-open position that resembles a grin. The sport is essentially like hide-and-go-seek, where a dog uses their nose to search out a certain odor. In this case, it's birch oil, paired with a doggy treat for a reward. So right now we're pairing the food with the odor so the dogs can get a quick reward. Soon the dog will associate the smell of birch with a food reward. First thing my dog Luca did was to search for food, which he loves, and then after several months we added the birch odor. It's an essential oil and we paired it with food. So now he associates the birch odor with his reward of food. The end goal is to have the dog search for the odor, not the food reward. This same technique is also used in professional scent detection. Everything from bed bugs to human remains, bonds, or narcotics. We're not teaching the dogs anything. They already know how to use their nose. We're just giving them a context and a parameters that's acceptable to us as people so that it keeps them out of trouble and they get to have fun doing it. A dog's sense of smell is their number one method of gathering information. They have from 125 to 300 million scent glands, depending on breed, compared to our meager 5 million. All breeds of dogs can participate in the sport. The concept of canine nose work is that it's accessible to as many dogs and as many people with as many different um, backgrounds and life challenges that we can possibly reach. We really try to embrace the animals that have sort of been shunned from other things that they do. Although all dogs have an incredible sense of smell, their methods can vary, and it's up to their owner to encourage their own unique way. So you can always tell what are gonna be some of the search styles of the different dogs. Some are gonna be get to source, stay there, and then immediately go on and find the next one. Other dogs are gonna be more likely to stay at source. Start a little bit closer to the car. Just start a little closer to the car. Now that they've mastered finding the odor in boxes, it's time to move on to something more complex. 
a vehicle search. And we don't use boxes in the vehicle searches because the vehicle itself is a large container. I'd bring him right up to the vehicle because he has no concept of what this is. Scent detection is a game that creates a level playing field. It doesn't matter how big or small, how strong or shy your dog may be, they just need to rely on their survival instincts. So now we have Bumper. Bumper is visually impaired. And what's interesting, you know, being blind, you would think that it, he would, it would take longer for him, but he was probably one of the most efficient dogs here. You know, he doesn't waste a lot of time at all. Been blind since birth. So he's been in survival mode his whole life. He doesn't waste a lot of time and energy because that couldn't be the difference between life and death for a dog like that. The sport of scent detection is gaining popularity across the country. And unlike other canine competitions, it's great for all breeds, ages, sizes, and abilities. It promotes confidence and gives the dog mental stimulation, which is ideal for shy, disabled, or older dogs. It's a sport that could be just right for your dog. Ah, good dog. We shake hands, but dogs greet each other by sniffing each other's butts. And because of their incredible sense of smell and special glands the dogs have in their rear ends, they can get information like gender, reproductive status, diet, and even clues about their emotional state. It may seem strange, but butt sniffing is simply a dog's way of shaking hands and saying hello. Many of us have dreamed of owning a horse. In this segment, we learn just what it takes to raise a pet horse. Let's head out to Mount Awili Stables on the east side of the Hawaii Island, Oahu. If you're thinking about getting a horse, there's a few things you should know before you get into it. I'm going to ah, get sugar plum ready for my riding lesson. Getting a horse is not like getting a dog or a cat. It's, it's a lot more like having a child. The responsibilities are pretty major. Because owning a horse is a big responsibility, both in time and uh, financially. Horses need food, shelter to be cleaned, and love. For thousands of years, before the invention of the modern day engine, people relied on horses to get around. These days, owning a vehicle may be cheaper than housing a horse. It's also a commitment that requires everyday TLC. Well, the first thing you're gonna need is a place for your horse to live. A lot of people like to keep their horse in the backyard, but I don't recommend that. We keep my horse at a stable where they feed it and keep it safe. Some places you can feed and water and muck the paddock yourself, and they're a little cheaper. So if you take care of the horse yourself, it means it's an everyday thing. Whether it's raining, you feel sick, uh, you have to still come, you have to feed at least twice a day. But usually it's gonna run you at least 100 bucks a month, up to 600 bucks a month for a place that provides full care. The average thousand pound horse eats 15 to 20 pounds of food each day. Horses, eat a lot. As you can see, their feed comes in bags that are about 50 pounds. They cost about 15 bucks a bag. Your horse can go through anywhere from three to five of these a week, usually. Horses also require regular medical attention. This is a wormer. Horses get a variety of worms. They have really delicate digestive systems, and they need to be wormed every six weeks to three months, uh, depending on what type of wormer you use. It's best to consult your vet to find out what kind of system you should be on for your horse. Water is really important. Horses need at least 15 to 20 gallons of fresh water per day. If they don't get it, they can have a variety of health issues. So you want to make sure your horse always has access to plenty of clean water. There are also various safety measures to be familiar with. This is how you park your horse. This is a special knot. Is it? It's a quick release knot. In case of an emergency and you need to untie your horse, you can untie it really fast. Another thing that's really important about horse ownership is foot care. Um, the saying goes, no hoof, no horse. Um, so getting your horse shod every six weeks um, is very important. Also keeping your horse's hooves clean, free of dirt and rocks. Horses are notoriously delicate in health issues. A vet visit can cost you anywhere from $50 to over $1,000. But it's not all work. There's time to play too, which makes owning a horse worth it for many. If you're still interested in getting a horse, here's some myths that you need to know about. 
First of all, a common myth is that getting a young horse for a young child is a good idea. Sugar Plum is 30 years old and I'm 10 years old. That's a big difference. Horses have an average lifespan of 25 to 30 years. However, young horses require special care and training that most people need to be very qualified to give. It can be extraordinarily dangerous to get a young horse if you don't know any training issues, and especially a young, inexperienced rider stands a chance of getting pretty seriously injured. One thing I've learned is that all horses have different personalities. Like Sugar Plum, she doesn't like to be brushed in her stall and she's very friendly. Within a breed, there are individuals just like there are in any group. So it's really important to check the age of the horse, the personality of the horse, the training and the background of the horse before you think about purchase. It's different than owning a cat or a dog, which are predator animals. Horses are naturally prey animals, so they have behaviors unique to them. They'll do a behavior called spooking, which means they think that something might be coming to get them from the bushes or a tree, or a lot of times it could be something flapping. It's possible they get hurt. It can be dangerous just because they're bigger than us. Any sudden movement might startle a horse, and it's a pretty major behavior if you're not used to dealing with it. Maybe before you consider buying a horse, perhaps take lessons or volunteer at a local equestrian facility or therapeutic riding center. At the very least, be sure to do your homework. Consult professionals on every aspect of horse care, feeding, management, and riding. The most important thing you need is love. So the bottom line is you have to really love horses and love what you're doing because most of the time you're not riding down the trail having a good time. I mean, that is a very, very small part of owning a horse. The biggest part is all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, the, the non-glamorous part, and uh, you gotta be into it and, and, and enjoy it. Just remember, it's a major investment, but like any big investment, the reward is that much greater. Riding a horse makes me feel happy. There are more than 500 dog breeds ranging from the world's smallest, the Chihuahua, to the mighty Great Dane. Our goal is to pick one and learn all about it in It's All About the Breed. Today, it's all about the Toy Fox Terrier. The Toy Fox Terrier is a descendant of the Fox Terrier, but is now considered a separate breed. They were originally developed in America by crossing smooth fox terriers with different toy breeds, including miniature pinchers, Italian greyhounds, chihuahuas, and Manchester terriers. The result is a dog that's a hunter like a terrier, but with a mild disposition. The toy fox terrier was first developed in the 1930s and recognized by the AKC in 2003. In addition to being very intelligent, they're great family pets and are outgoing, friendly, and very loyal to their families. They adapt well to apartment living, but love to be outdoors and like to hunt and play. They're good with children, although with any toy breed, it's best not to introduce them to very young children. Because of their extreme loyalty, the Toy Box Terrier is often called a big dog in a little package and has an ego that will dominate almost every situation. Their intelligence, though, also makes them excel at other duties. Toy Fox Terriers are highly animated, comical, entertaining, and playful their whole life. And if trained right, they don't bark much. Although they love to hunt and play, they're also comfortable just relaxing. Toy Fox Terriers come in a number of colors. Tricolor, which has a black head with tan markings over a white coat, the white chocolate and tan variety, white and blacks, and white and tans. As for health issues, the Toy Fox Terrier is considered a very healthy breed. Problems that may arise include periodontal disease, knee problems, and allergic reactions to some foods. When fully grown, they'll be eight and a half to 11 and a half inches tall and weigh between three and a half to nine pounds. Their life expectancy is about 15 years. If you're interested in getting a Toy Fox Terrier, find a reputable breeder, do your homework, and make sure it's the right choice for you. And now you know all about the Toy Fox Terrier. In just a second, we'll find out just how fast these dogs will run for bacon. Not surprisingly, the dog that's used for commercial racing is the fastest. 
the Greyhound, which can run at a top speed of just over 40 miles an hour. Go! In this segment, we see how even the shortest four-legged dogs have the need for speed. And we learn a few facts about the dachshund as we take you to the annual Hawaii Wiener Dog Race. We have here like hundreds of dachshunds here and it's just a great event to have see them all together and just we are at the weenie race and uh, we're going to get our dogs a uh, gold medal <laughs> so there's a lot more weenies on island than i thought there were the dogs put their speed to the test on this 70-foot course from start to finish some of the top competitors on oahu are here to strut their stuff my dog is Frank, he's in heat five. He made it to the finals last year and a dog ran him over and so he did not win a thing. I'm a pretty competitive guy and actually we've been training him so I know he's capable of winning it so I'd like to see him do it. This is Lady Bell, this is going to be our first doxy derby. Our secret to get, trying to get her to win is to yell as loud as we can. Lady Bell, hey. Lady, over here, turn around Lady Bell, face the door. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Dachshund is a German word that literally translates to badger hound. Because of their shape, they're able to hunt underground and are great at trailing scents. That trade dates back to the 1400s and is just as acute today as it was back then. But as you can see, that can also be a distraction on the way to the finish line. These popular races have over 100 participants and have to be well organized. Here's how it works. The dogs are put into starting gate boxes that match their bandana. Then the owners entice their dogs any way they can by calling their name or waving their favorite toy. And then they try to hold their attention as they walk down to the finish line. From there, the race is on and total chaos erupts. The first wiener across the finish line wins. Some of these dogs will go into a national championship race held each year where the fastest hot dog is awarded the Wiener National title. Yay! Some owners take unusual steps to motivate their dog. With Frank, we practice with bacon. We actually fry bacon and I rub it on my hands and on my arms and I just run and make him run with me. He follows me anywhere the bacon is. And apparently bacon did the trick for this top team. I told you I knew that I was doing. How important is it to you and your dog? I don't think Frank cares at all. I care a lot. <laughs> Whether they're motivated by bacon, toys, or just love, these little guys don't waste time getting to the finish line. Just how fast are they running? 20, 25 miles an hour. Just a human can reach that fast, I think. It's definitely faster than I can run, and let's just say five miles an hour. <laughs> Five, six miles an hour at least. I would say 15 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour, <laughs> where the little dogs, I mean, they're going. Believe it or not, weeder dogs were bred to hunt and chase. They can run up to 15 to 20 miles an hour. But as you can see, the speed can vary from dog to dog. Wiener dog, or dachshund racing, is fairly new to the U.S. It started in Australia and spread to the U.S. in the 90s. Today, there are wiener races all over the country and a national race is held each year in San Diego. These little dogs prove that size doesn't matter when it comes to wiener dog racing. It's all about having fun. Some of these little guys aren't able to run like their friends, though. Like some other breeds, dachshunds can suffer from hip dysplasia, and because they have such long spines and short rib cages, they could also have spinal problems. If you're thinking about entering your pet in a wiener dog race, you might want to check with your vet just to make sure everything's okay. Then the fun begins, and it's hard to tell who's enjoying it more, the wieners or their owners. These hot dogs are truly hot dogs when it comes to racing. 
Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between humans and animals in one of the most beautiful places on earth, Hawaii. Here's what's coming up. We'll find out how the black cat became a superstitious icon. Then we'll witness how one dog's dream to be a mother comes true. We'll learn just how big a Great Dane can get, along with a few other facts about the breed. Plus, dogs learning to rescue humans in some of the most trying conditions. Pets in Paradise TV starts now. It's a scientific fact that all biological life wants to pass on its DNA through its offspring. So for the last two years, the lady's been struggling with really wanting to be a mother. And Lady is no exception. But she was spayed a few years ago and can't get pregnant. But she doesn't know that. She's uh, tried to look for little stuffed animals and toys around the house to try to nurse. And it's been so sad because we can just see how strong her desire has been. Over time, that biological desire grew stronger. Lady's been having some false pregnancies, and because her body's been telling her that she's having babies, she's been lactating considerably off and on for the last couple of years. So it's not uncommon for false pregnancy to happen in dogs and cats both. We were just hoping that something could be done that she could help someone else help some other lives with that milk that she's been having. The reality is it's a hormonal thing strictly. They are going through the motions of pregnancy even without puppies. Some of it can be short to where they develop some, some mammary enlargement but don't ever get as far as giving milk. And some will go as far as nesting, acting like they're giving birth, and they'll give milk for six to eight weeks before they break the cycle. So when my grandson was born, Lady was so wanting a baby that she would like lick him all over and try to clean his diaper area and just really treat him like uh, maybe he was her baby. Unbeknownst to her, Lady's longing to be a mother will soon be answered. Meanwhile, 20 miles to the west at the Oahu SPCA, Lady's prayers may have been answered, but in a bittersweet way. A litter of puppies came in that were abandoned on purpose in front of a grocery store in a basket, um, eyes closed, umbilical cords still attached. If these puppies do not get fed, it is possible that they will not make it. Unfortunately, since these puppies were just dropped at our doorstep and it's so last minute, it is hard to find the volunteers and manpower to do the bottle feeding. Luckily, the Oahu SPCA has a huge network of people who are willing to foster dogs, but finding someone at the last minute is hard. Then, after searching for hours through the database, they found Lady. A short time later, Lady met the puppies. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And the puppies found just what they were looking for. Lady's been lactating, and so it was perfect timing. And we got together um, early evening yesterday, and after some time, uh, less than an hour, uh, Lady and the puppies were, um, were doing their thing. The puppies were latched on very well, and Lady was bathing them and um, nursing them and uh, just doing everything in perfection. It's a win-win. What's happening is really Lady's dream come true because um, she's been wanting to nurse. She's had the milk and, um, and her nickname's been Mama. She's finally able to do what she's been longing to do for the last two years or so. What a good mama you are, Lady. Thanks to Lady, these puppies are definitely gonna succeed and make it and will be available for adoption. It definitely was a happy ending. The puppies were all adopted to loving homes. Lady no longer has false pregnancies and is living a full and happy life.
under dark of night. With spooky eyes and invisible to many, it's the black cat. Long considered to be a source of evil and bad luck. But why is that? Veterinarians agree that there is nothing about black cats that's any different than any other type of cat. So as veterinarians, we treat all sorts of animals, large, small, black, and otherwise. And there's never any documented information specifically to black cats. No diseases, no psychoses, no breeding issues. They're wonderful pets. So why is it that black cats get the scary rap? I don't know why people think black cats are bad luck, because I used to have one, and the only bad luck he brought was his pee everywhere. The media, it's a media scam. Historically, the link between black cats and bad luck started with an English king. He had a black cat, and when the cat died, the king became plagued with a whole lot of bad luck, some so bad that it killed him. Looking back, it's easy to say that the king's political mistakes, and with his many enemies, the king would have had the same amount of bad luck and would have died even if he didn't have a cat, black or otherwise. On the other side of the coin, people from some other countries, including Asia and the United Kingdom, think the black cat is lucky. Many cultures, though, consider it bad luck and will go out of their way to avoid having a black cat cross their path. Why are these people afraid of them? I'm actually a little scared of black cats, too. It's the way I grew up. Delving into the history books, the superstition about black cats goes back as far as the Middle Ages. Evil spirits were said to be attracted to black cats, who in turn would pass on the evil to humans. Witches got into the act too, and considered black cats a spiritual conduit. In fact, black cats were often burned at the stake along with the witches. Witches, or their cats, aren't being burned at the stake anymore, but during the Halloween season, animal advocates watch for people who may cause harm by abusing or torturing black cats, thinking they are bad. So black cats historically have had a problem all through October based on the Halloween rituals. Um, they're abused and tortured far more often during, the, during this time frame. Um, and of course, we see the we see the results, so to speak. Pick your favorite chain massacre, whatever movie, and that or some version of it is what these guys will suffer through. Um, as a foundation, we don't adopt out from October 1st to November 1st, anybody who's black. Um, but additionally, we found that the abuse can extend to white cats, German shepherds, and now apparently also Rottweilers. So we're not adopting those animals during this month. In addition to being associated with witches, cats are nocturnal. And when you talk about black cats, they're a perfect symbol for a night-based holiday like Halloween. So why do dogs eat grass? Is it to induce vomiting? Is it a need for fiber or certain vitamins? The truth is, no one is sure, even after decades of studies. Most dogs eat grass when given the opportunity, but why they do it is unclear. It's not because they have an upset stomach and want to induce vomiting. A very small percentage of dogs who eat grass were ill before they ate it. It's also not likely that they're seeking certain nutrients or fiber, because when their diets are modified to include those things, the dog still eats grass. And it could be that grass simply tastes good. What all researchers do agree on is that eating grass is normal dog behavior. One word of caution though, the grass they eat could contain harmful chemicals. You can protect your dog by using only non-toxic products on your lawn and prevent them from eating grass that you're unsure of. There are more than 500 dog breeds ranging from the world's smallest, the Chihuahua, to the mighty Great Dane. Our goal is to pick one and learn all about it in It's All About the Breed. Today, it's all about the Great Dane. The Great Dane is the biggest dog breed in the world. The average height is at least 30 inches for a male and 28 for a female. And the minimum weight for a male is 120 pounds. The Great Dane was originally created by crossing the Irish Wolfhound with a Mastiff. And the purpose was to hunt boar and become guard dogs. The Great Dane's gentle and friendly disposition, however, doesn't make him a very good guard dog. 
although his imposing size could scare off most any intruder. Danes come in six colors, fawn, brindle, blue, black, harlequin, and mantle. They come with floppy ears, but back in their hunting days, their ears were cropped to make them stand up and were safer when working. These days, some owners elect to have them cropped to maintain the tradition, but many do not. Ear cropping has gone out of favor, and many countries have even banned the practice. As with any breed, Danes need to be walked regularly, but become very attached to their owners and like to be by their side. Ironically, Danes are good apartment dogs. Nutrition is a little different with Great Danes. Because of their fast growth, their diets are restricted as puppies and as adults. They are fed several small meals a day and are not to be exercised after eating. Health issues can include hip dysplasia, stomach problems, and congenital heart disease. Sadly, the lifespan of a Great Dane is only six to eight years. Even though these gentle giants appear intimidating, they are considered one of the friendliest breeds and are great with children. They generally get along well with other dogs as well as cats and even horses. They love to play together. But because of their enormous size, Great Danes need to be trained at an early age. Otherwise, they can knock over furniture, valuable household items, and young children. They also tend to lean against their owners as a sign of affection and are sometimes called the world's biggest lapdog. In Hollywood, two Great Danes are famous. The cartoon character Scooby-Doo and Fang, Hagrid's dog in Harry Potter. And here's some trivia. Before the Hawkeye was chosen, the Great Dane was the mascot of the University of Iowa. And now you know all about the Great Dane. In this changing world of ours, it seems natural disasters are occurring more and more often. If you should find yourself in the aftermath of one and need help, you might be surprised who comes to your rescue. Dog. In this segment, we're going to learn how dogs are being trained to find survivors in some of the worst conditions imaginable. The Hawaii State Civil Defense Canine Unit is a volunteer organization that trains and deploys search and rescue dogs statewide. Uh, my name is Gary Wigan. I'm a canine handler with the Urban Search and Rescue Team here in Hawaii. And um, my daytime job, I'm an advertising representative. My name is Arthur. I'm from the Big Island. I actually work as a tour guide around the volcano area. Uh, in my spare time, I come out here to do the search and rescue. Hey, I'm Donna. I'm a veterinary technician, and I volunteer with the Hawaii Search and Rescue Group. Hi, I'm Juliet. And my passion, what I do full time now because I'm unemployed, is dog handling. These highly trained disaster search dog teams are becoming an increasingly important component in response efforts around the world. We just performed a search. My dog Lava and I did. Uh, this is part of the training right up here. We have a simulated collapsed building. We were not allowed to enter into it because there was hazardous materials inside of it. Prior to that, we did a perimeter search with also a couple of smaller collapsed buildings. Lava indicated, uh, found one of the victims. Once he's located the victim, we marked the location, and then that would uh, be later on followed up, confirmed that there was somebody in there. And then in this particular case, they were trapped during the simulation so that we'd have to make entry. Another element of the group would make entry. Our typical volunteer for our canine unit with the Urban Search and Rescue Team, first and foremost, just has to be dedicated. They have to believe in the mission of helping people. And then the other things that come into play are they need time, a lot of time in training, uh, training the personnel, training the canine. They need to be in shape. We do a lot of physical activity, both for search and rescue and for wilderness rescue. And they have to be dedicated. We don't know when we're going to get deployed. When things happen, it happens, and uh, we need to be able to go. Training day consists of a range of tragic scenarios in order for the dogs to learn how to search for and rescue people. I was just called out for a mock search with my canine partner, Hina, and we were asked to clear the area, and the area began outside of this building, and she located one subject. Hello, can you hear me? And then we came into here, Hina, Hina, search! Into the building and found another subject who actually did come out, so we know he was in there. 
So Hina is only looking for the inaccessible people in this room or in this building right now. And that's why she won't bark at somebody who's sitting up in a chair or standing up who's who are visible to her. She's only looking for the inaccessible subject. After she finds the subject, you, you find out what your dog's favorite thing is, toy or food. And Hina's is a toy, which is this toy right here in my pocket. And um, if I pull it out, she'll start playing, so we won't do that right now. But you find out what is the highest reward for the dog. And then in training, it's actually the subject, the person that you find will come out and reward the dog. But in reality, in a real disaster, it's the human, it's the handler, because I won't be able to rescue, will come and get the person out. So the dog is rewarded by me in the real disaster. In order to become FEMA certified, each canine handler team must pass a rigorous national certification. The dog must be at least 18 months old to attempt the test and be physically and emotionally mature enough to do this job. The canine handler teams must be recertified every three years in order to participate in search and rescue operations. One week later, the canine team is back training. The terrain is different, but the goal is the same. Today we're working on our wilderness search and rescue scenario. So we have a subject uh, out in the, in the grass out here hiding and mimicking a person that may have become lost. I'm going to be the subject, so I'll be out in the, the vegetation. I'll be hiding where the dog cannot visually see me. He'll have to use his nose to find me. And when he does find me, we're going to use a bark alert. A uh, bark alert is when the canine comes upon the subject and finds him and will start to speak and bark. When you hear that alert, everybody has to hustle, get up and go, and catch up with the dog. The dog will keep barking until the handler arrives. So the subject is hidden, hidden now, the wind is blowing nicely, and uh, it's up to Nui now to find her. I'm going ahead and start my dog. Sit. Mm -hmm. I can hear him coming, he's getting closer now. We should see him here any minute. What you just saw is the most basic and rudimentary problem in the grassy field. We're, now we're going to take it up another level and uh, work the dog in the trees. Okay, so Alyssa, we're going to set up your problem and we're going to have Shay in the trees today. And actually, we're going to put her up in one of the trees to kind of uh, challenge Jack even a little more. You okay with that? Sounds good. Okay, let's do it. The main objective is to clear large areas of possible victims. What would take days for a team of humans to clear, one dog can do in just a few hours. This is Jack, he's a three-year-old Border Collie. We've been together for two years. Uh, he lives with me in my home, but he's my working partner. A uh, typical day in the life of Jack would be uh, some training, uh, a lot of exercise, and maybe a little bit of play. In a matter of minutes, Jack followed our victim's scent and found her up a tree. He sounded his bark alert, then got his reward. Mission accomplished. Hey, we're going to set up a problem in an open field. We have a subject in the grass on the far side of this field, and when we release the dog from this area, we're going to be able to see the dog move and, and uh, bob and weave until he gets into a scent cone. A scent cone is the odor that's coming from the person blowing downwind, and that's what the dog is searching for. Once they hit that odor, they're going to start working that cone. It'll be larger as it gets further away from the person. So he's about ready to release Gunner, and there he goes. We can see Gunner weaving back and forth through the scent cone, each weave getting tighter and tighter as he heads up the scent cone. The canine unit is not breed specific. Any breed of dog is eligible to try out, but what really matters is that the dog has a strong drive. Often dogs that have been passed around from family to family because of an obsessive drive find a permanent place on the team. To these dogs, it's all fun and games. Little do they know how important their work is. They're saving lives that humans couldn't. 